um, technology. There you go. Turn. Good, Dottie. There you go, Dottie. Who said you couldn't do that? Right. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody to a new series. Uh, simply put, inclusion, but more broadly put, to the way in which God wants us to love one another and to recognize that he has created us all. Therefore, he loves us all and wants us all to thrive and to feel loved and supported. So we're starting our series off with one of our dear friends, Dr. Crystal Hall, who's gonna to talk to us about what it's like to be a woman <laughs> in the ministry or, or just serving God in different ways uh, in a pretty much still dominant male community. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dottie. And it's always a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the invitation. It's good to see many of familiar faces mm -hmm. and some new faces, which is amazing. Um, my name is, as Dottie said, Dr. Crystal Hall. I serve as the craft assistant professor of biblical studies mm -hmm. at United Lutheran Seminary. And I'm also a coach for women in ministry. Yeah. And so I'm going to be speaking today, not only wearing my biblical studies hat, but also wearing my coach hat, um, speaking specifically to the experience of women in ministry. So I want to start by telling a story. I was at one point even younger than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> and I did my undergraduate degree at Boston University. I was a music performance major mm -hmm. as an undergrad, believe it or not. Um, played clarinet, feels like a lifetime ago. But at the time, I was very involved in Lutheran campus ministry, especially my junior and senior years. I um, worshiped at University Lutheran Church over in Cambridge, Mass. And was at that point really starting to discern a call to ministry. At that point, I didn't know what that call was, but I found myself thinking, okay, I, I have this heritage of being a Lutheran. I grew up in the church. I had been in the New England Synod all my life and, and then had gone to BU and was just sort of thinking, okay, this is something that I've inherited, but what does it mean for me to take up this tradition? What does it mean for me to have my own sort of relationship with this tradition beyond what was handed on to me. And at the time, um, as a clarinet player, I was dating a bass player. <laughs> and uh, he was he was a master's student while I was an undergrad and um, I was in the ELCA and he was quite a bit more conservative than I was religiously. And I have this vivid memory where we're, if you know anything about Boston, we were walking down Commonwealth Avenue. It was a fall day and the sun was shining and I was, you know, I was just really wrestling with, with this call and what that meant for my life and wanted to share a little bit about this with my boyfriend at the time. He's not my boyfriend anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and I said to him, you know, like I've been really involved in campus ministry. I'm really thinking about what this means for my life. I'm thinking about going to seminary. And he said to me, like, very seriously, he stopped in the middle of the street and he turned and he looked at me and he said, Crystal, don't you know that women can't be pastors? Oh, no, no, no. Don't wow. you know that women are to be silent in church? Oh, boy. <laughs> are you serious? Well, he quoted First Timothy 2 at me. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I just said, well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah. It was just, it was this moment that at, you know, in my early 20s, I think if I did not have the support of my faith community, if I did not have the support of a campus ministry pastor, if I had had that conversation and didn't have those relationships, I wonder if I would be here today. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder because of that attitude or that and that theology, which is the dominant theology in Christian culture in the United States today, that I, I wonder if things might have turned out differently in the midst of that conversation. And so I share that with you as a way of introduction, because I want to share that even though I'm someone who's in my mid-30s, I grew up in an era in which the church was already ordaining women. I grew up in a church where I had women pastors 
And yet this is my experience, never mind the experience of women in the generations before me where women were first being ordained, that this is this is so new in the history of the church. And for people in my generation, this is these are still live questions. That that women in ministry is still not a normative issue by any stretch of the imagination, but it's still something that's being challenged even today, even as the ELCA continues to ordain women. So I want to share, because I'm a biblical studies person and I can't help it, <laughs> um, I just want to I want to share two passages with you. One is that passage that was just quoted at me um, from 1 Timothy 2. And I'll just, I'll read a little bit of it. And I feel like it's always important to hear it in a woman's voice, um, just for the heck of it. So this is uh, 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 11. And I'll just read until the end of the section. So the author of 1 Timothy writes, let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man she is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first and then Eve, this is bad exegesis, but that's a forum for another day. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. I am so glad you are giggling. That is. Yes. <laughs> Can we just rip that page right out of the Bible? Just rip yeah. this page right out of the Bible. Um, yes, this is a text that is blatantly misogynistic. This is a text that is explicitly silencing women. Um, and not only women in general, but specifically women within the church and women having authority in the church. And I want to provide a little bit of context because I know that this is a group that's very open to these ideas and that we've talked about them before, that First and Second Timothy and Titus are part of the Pauline corpus that's called Pastoral Paul. So First and Second Timothy and Titus are part of a subgroup within the Pauline letters known as Pastoral Paul. Pastoral Paul is writing in the name of Paul, the historical Paul. Um, I know we've talked about this before. And this is probably a second or even third generation follower of Paul after the historical Paul himself. And so this letter, 1 Timothy, as well as 2 Timothy and Titus, they're written in the early second century um, probably at least 75 years after the historical Paul, which means that it's responding to a radically different context where the church is beginning to form as an institution. The church is um, under not systematic, but more intense forms of persecution. There's much more pressure to conform to the dominant Greco-Roman culture, which mm -hmm. means accommodating to the dominant gender norms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so because the early church is seen as a marginalized and strange group of Jesus followers, they're already seen as suspicious. One of the ways that they were supposedly keeping their heads down um, to a certain extent, even though martyrdom is occurring in this period as well, is that there is this move toward conforming to the dominant culture, which includes conforming to gender norms. So one of the things that I've said before, and I will continue to say, is that the Bible does not speak with one voice. The Bible doesn't speak with one voice on gender Sorry. issues. The Bible doesn't speak with one voice on any issue. And so hearing this text, I want to place this in dialogue with another text, also from Paul or from the Pauline corpus, because I, I would offer that this is not Paul. This is not the historical Paul, but that this is an author who's writing in the generations after Paul, in the name of Paul, and in the tradition of Paul which is a very common practice in antiquity because the value in antiquity is on things that are old, not on things that are new. So if you're a follower of Paul, you don't wanna write in your own name, but you wanna write in the name of your teacher as a sign of deference and respect to your teacher. Which we now call plagiarism. Which we yeah. now call plagiarism, <laughs> but in antiquity- so it's, hard, it's hard to get your head around that. Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. Because at the beginning of First Timothy, 
It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Mm -hmm. It just uh, says Paul, mm -hmm. right? So we assume that it's the same guy, and it would make total sense if we don't have that historical context. So, of course, we assume it's all the same guy, but it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so let me pause here before I go back to the other verse that I want to put in dialogue with this one. Any, I'm, I'm again, I'm delighted by the giggles when I read this. Um, what, are, what are your comments or questions about some of these ideas? The difficulty is when you come across someone like your boyfriend who makes that argument, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can't just say, well, this, this quote that you use is not authentically Paul. It's not, you know, part of the acceptance. I, and I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's just so funny because you're, you're, you know, that there are things in the Bible that just, you know, that they just don't work and mm -hmm. they aren't authentic, you know, Paul. So I mean, it just doesn't even sound like Paul mm -hmm. in the rest of his epistles. Mm -hmm. That just, it's so frustrating to read that but that's used as a proof text yes it's sure it is all, all the time there's a lot of um the, my first thought this is tells you tv i watch it sounds like the duggars and i don't know whether 19 kids and counting and they're very yeah. very long yeah. and, yeah. and you know whatever and the girls that have cut their hair and you know i mean it's all that stuff and you know i mean this if, if you want to proof text it yeah. there it is rip it out yeah yeah, yeah. I was thinking of two things. I was thinking of this inherit the nerd postcard. Um, this is a guy who does like religious humor, and uh, he had somebody writing, "I, Paul, an apostle of Christ, uh, I'm greeting you and asking you to keep your dog out of my begonia." So. <laughs> <laughs> the, the letters, and you see that it just makes you laugh. And the other thing was that when we had diaconia, we had. Um, <laughs> We had a teacher for six weeks who was from Missouri Lutheran Senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked when he said, we don't allow women to be pastors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, how's that working out for you? Do you have enough pastors? And he said, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, so they still, Missouri Lutheran. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. a woman can't be a pastor. Mm -hmm. There was a time in Missouri Synod where women couldn't even be parochial school teachers. Mm -hmm. And what changed that was World War II. <laughs> oh, and no, the no, men no. went off to no. war, and the Missouri Synod said, well, I guess it's okay for women to teach since yeah. the men are gone. <laughs> so the point of that is there, there's people in Missouri Synod with a little bit of wisdom who say, it'll change. It'll just take time when, yeah. they, when they have to, when they have no choice. It's kind of like Winston Churchill said about Americans, you know. You can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after everything else has failed. <laughs> and the Missouri Synod is the epitome of that. And I'm, in, I'm born and bred in Missouri yes. Synod, so is Dawn. And, yes. and, and I'm glad I have Missouri Synod roots. Yeah. But there, there came a point where, you know, this That's is a little bit too much. So, you know, I don't concern myself with, with that. And I still have a lot of Missouri Synod friends, you know, because uh, I went to a Missouri Synod college. And I just, you know what? They'll catch on. I, I probably won't live to see it, but yeah, you know, yeah, they'll catch right. on. You know, I think we have enough problems out there. Yeah, no, sorry. I just think the synod and cynic in me is sitting here thinking when I left, you were dealing with Timothy. Uh, I guess there's nothing wrong with our money, huh? Mm -hmm. I, I guess that can be <laughs> used and okay. offered and given it. Mm -hmm. Because if long as you do it quiet, yeah. <laughs> you think of the early church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of how many women of some wealth mm -hmm. opened their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, not only offering them financial support, but also mm -hmm. putting themselves in a physical mm -hmm. situation of perhaps threat. You yeah. know, with their lives and such. But I mean, I hear what you're saying, Bill. But I, I guess having lived long enough. Uh, I don't, I have trouble accepting the thought, well, it'll eventually happen. I want it to happen now. <laughs> well, I think we all want it to happen now, but you know, as I said, you know, we we have so much on our plate now. I'm just not going to, 
I'm not going to spend my time being concerned about people who don't see the light. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. No, because there, there's agree. such a dire need in other areas. But, yeah, I do agree, but I what I'm thinking more of is, you know, recognizing for any woman serving in a ministry today mm -hmm. that perhaps they need a little bit more of our support mm -hmm. than one would think when we think of being a pastor, being called. Um, it, it's not just the blatant view mm -hmm. or behavior that can cause distress. But with myself going into the administrative end of education, mm -hmm. how I had to literally fight my way in to be accepted and respected. Mm -hmm. And I could not have done that successfully unless I had people challenging that whole situation. Mm -hmm. So I know you're not saying, well, we'll sit back and it'll eventually happen. But I think there's also a role that we need to assume hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. And too. we're doing that in the exactly. ELCA. And I guess my question to Crystal is, okay, it's easy to talk about Missouri Synod and Wisconsin and all the others on mm -hmm. Right. But in the ELCA, yeah. what is the, uh, I don't want to say prevailing, maybe it is, yeah. what is the general <laughs> attitude toward women in ministry in the ELCA, mm -hmm. which based on my experience, prides itself as being pretty progressive. Mm -hmm. Is that a, is that a, is that a, is that true or not? Yeah. No, I think this is a really, I think this is a, a great set of yeah. themes to be thinking about because it's very easy to say our siblings in the Missouri Synod or our siblings in the Wisconsin Synod or the conservative, like the basically fundamentalists like my ex-boyfriend, right? It's very easy to go to the folks outside of our denomination and say, oh, well, they're not like us. Um, within the ELCA, I mean, recently there was the celebration of the 50th um, anniversary of the ordination of women and the 40th anniversary of the ordination of the first woman of color and then the 10th anniversary of the first openly out LGBTQIA plus candidates, uh, 50 years. I mean, that this is this is a drop in the bucket when we think about the history of Christianity. Yeah. And I wanna share a couple of statistics with you. One is that um, the Gender Justice Office, which is part of the Office of the Presiding Bishop of the ELCA, recently did a survey on um, and gathered quite a bit of data on the realities that women in ministry face today in the ELCA, which prides itself on being a progressive organization. And nearly half, nearly half of women in ministry reported experiencing sexual harassment on the jobs. Nearly half. And the pay gap between women in ministry and men in ministry continues to be consistent with the pay gap in the broader culture, which means that women in ministry are paid at about between 70 to 80 percent of what men are paid for the same work. And when you add in the factor of race on top of the factor of gender, then the pay gap becomes even more significant. Um, because then you're at about 60%. So if you compare women of color to white men, the pay gap is that women of color are paid about 60% of what men, white men are paid. And so while the ELCA prides itself on being a progressive congregation or a progressive denomination, and theologically in some ways, certainly it is, I think we also in the ELCA have to look at the realities that yes, we are ordaining women and women of color and women who identify as LGBTQIA+. And as a church, there is still quite a bit of work to do in terms of engaging with the realities that sexism pervades not only the broader culture, but that sexism continues to pervade the church because of the history of the church as a largely patriarchal, largely male dominated institution. And so part of the work that I do as a coach is really helping women to understand how new the work that we're doing is. That even though I grew up in a generation where women were being ordained 
in the church that there's still so much that women are breaking ground on, that this is not, that the church, the, the culture of the church broadly has not yet changed because the culture of the church still does not see the leadership of women as normative because also within the broader culture, the leadership of women is not seen as normative. I mean, the fact that there has still not been a woman president in the United States, the majority of people who are elected officials continue to be men. The majority of governors continue to be men. The majority of people in professional classes like doctors and lawyers, like they continue to be more men than women. And so what's happening in the church is in many ways still largely a reflection of what's happening in society. But unfortunately, I think the church has done itself no favors when it continues to propagate a theology that is still largely based in let women be silent. Because I want to, before we um, before we move into the other scripture that I had in mind for today, I wanted to come back to uh, some of picking up on some of what Dottie said about the prevalence of women in ministry in the early church. I have a question. Yes. Real quick. Mm -hmm. um, what you said about the, the church being indicative of society at large, is that an asset or a liability? Because one could argue either side of that coin, you know, says, well, we're no better or worse than society at large. But you could also turn that around and say, well, all the more reason we ought to be setting the tone rather than following. Right. And I, so my question, and maybe this is unanswerable, mm -hmm. is that an asset or a liability to say, well, it's a reflection of society at large? I don't think it's necessarily an asset. I mean, I don't think we can think there are ways in which women in society today have more power than they've ever had historically. I mean, the fact that in the 1970s, women still needed a male co-signer to get a credit card, mm -hmm. Um, that it's only been a hundred years since women have had the right to vote, yeah. um, that there are many ways in which women have, I think, been, I mean, taken, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say been put in positions of power because they have really organized to take those positions of power. So I think there are some ways in which the church following after the trends of the culture is a good thing. Um, I think there are other ways in which following the trends of the broader culture is not life-giving because the the culture continues to be one that is explicitly and not so explicitly sexist. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's a way to say it's one or the other because yeah. there are ways in which it's an asset. There are sort it's of like both. That. The answer is it's both. Yeah, oh, okay. I, would, I would say so. I'll buy that. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's okay if you don't too. So I want to come back to um, this point about the leadership of women in ministry in the in the earliest church. And so I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about Romans. Um, Romans, unlike First Timothy, is a letter that is written by the historical Paul. So Romans is a letter that's being written in the decade of the 50s, perhaps the early 60s of the first century. This is written by the historical Paul, not a follower of the historical Paul uh, decades later, like first Timothy. And so it, it reflects a different theology. It reflects a different time. I would argue that the that authentic Paul is perhaps the most egalitarian um, of the different Pauls within. So there's there's authentic Paul, there's pastoral Paul, there's there's some ambiguity about some of the letters that may or may not have been written by the historical Paul. So there are several within the New Testament itself. But they all say at the beginning of them, I, Paul, <laughs> which is part of the complexity here. So I just want to read for you an example from Romans 16, which is at the very end of the, it's the last chapter in the letter, and it's what's called the postscript. So it's the part of the letter where Paul is making all of his personal greetings. He's saying hello to everyone. And there's over 30 people that are mentioned in this text. And I'm not going to read the whole text, but there are 10 women that are named. Um, and that's, I don't think, an accident. So I want to just highlight a few of them. 
So this is Romans 16, starting at verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon, Phoebe, a deacon of the church, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require of you, for she has been a benefactor of many and myself as well. So Phoebe here is being described as a deacon. She's being described as a benefactor. Because she's listed first, she is probably the carrier of the letter and is the person who is responsible for the interpretation of the letter. So Phoebe here clearly can't be silent in church if she is to be the interpreter of the letter and the one who's carrying it. So, and it all, in verse three, greet Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So Prisca or Priscilla is listed before her husband. This is also significant because it's highly unusual for the woman to be listed first. So it's possible um, Priscilla and Aquila are also mentioned in Acts. Uh, it's very possible that it's Priscilla and not her husband who is the leader of the house church that they organize. And I want to highlight one other woman in this list. Let me just, just give me a second to find her. Okay, verse 7. It says, greet Andronicus and Junia. Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles. Mm -hmm. So women were in prison. Uh huh. Wow. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles. Junia, the apostle. Mm -hmm. And not only the apostle, but prominent among the apostles. Now, in your study Bibles, you're going to have a lovely little footnote next to the name Junia. And I will read the footnote for you, which says, or Junius, other ancient authorities, read Julia. So what's super interesting is that it's not until the 12th century that Junia gets changed to Junius, which is a male name. Oh. It's not until the 12th century in the manuscripts that Ju Junia gets changed to Junius, which is not a name that exists in antiquity, <laughs> by the way. Um, but Junius, it, the name just becomes masculinized because clearly the church is very uncomfortable with the idea that Junia could be a woman and be an apostle. Mm -hmm. So there clearly is evidence from the earliest Paul, from the authentic Paul, of women serving not only in the church, but women serving in positions of leadership. So why is it that the church has largely sided with 1 Timothy and has largely ignored Phoebe and Priscilla and Junia? Because, of course, the history of the church has been written by men. men. The Bible has almost exclusively in its history been interpreted by men. And so it matters who is doing the work of reading and interpreting the text. It matters who's doing the work of writing the history. Because it's really only until the 1970s that women are credentialed as biblical scholars for the first time. It's only in the 1970s that women are being credentialed in any sort of way in serious numbers to start making shifts within the academy. In the 1970s, have I'm women right. always, yeah, it's a long time. I mean, women have been interpreting the Bible throughout history. I mean, it's not to deny that women have been interpreters of the Bible. There's, there's certainly evidence of women being interpreters. But what's, what's different about now is that there are women who are actually credentialed in the same way that men are credentialed. And that is a very recent historical development when we look at the history of scholarship. So I think it does matter who's actually doing the work of interpreting when we're looking at these texts. 
So in our last five minutes, I want to bring it because we need to wrap up at 1030. Yes. yes. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's totally fine. So in our last five minutes, I want to bring in one more text. We're sort of doing a whirlwind tour here. So I want to give you a counterbalance to First Timothy. Like this is where I want to end, like as a way of noting that the Bible doesn't speak with one voice on these issues of women's leadership. So not only do we have Romans 16 as a resource, but I also want to offer um, what it what has been sort of a classical text or a classic text in not only arguing for the ordination of women, but also arguing for the inclusion of other kinds of excluded classes within the church. And so this is from Galatians 3, verses 26 to 29. I'll just read it briefly for you. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ, you um, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And so what Paul is doing here is that he's taking these binaries of hierarchical power that exists within his society, a Greek over and against Jew, free over and against slave, male over and against female. And he's saying that these hierarchical relationships of power mean nothing within the body of Christ. That to be within the body of Christ is to be on the same playing field, not in hierarchical relationships, but in horizontal relationships relationships of mutuality and solidarity where we are all one in Christ through our baptism. That it is through our baptism that we are all, that the playing field is leveled. And so this is, I think, one of those important resources alongside Romans 16 and some of the other texts that we could look at to say, all right, so we, on the one hand, we've got this text that says women be silent. But on the other hand, we've got these other texts that have some other, other ideas about what it is to be a woman in ministry, what it is to be doing church work as women. And so the question is not, well, what does the Bible say? That for me is never the question because we can use the Bible to make it say anything that we want it to say. But the question is, where does, where does your theological choice land? in terms of how you choose to interpret which scriptures you decide are going to be more life-giving, more liberating for the church and for the world than others. And that is always an interpretive choice because some scholars and some pastors will say, well, the Bible says, right? And they will wag their finger when they do it and i always get a little sassy with that and i always start with well which bible <laughs> let's start there um but beyond that i think what's so important if this is the only thing that you take away from our time together is that there is always a choice in interpretation that we can choose women be silent or we can choose there is no longer male and female we can choose Phoebe the deacon and Junia the apostle, or we can choose they shall be saved through childbearing, <laughs> right? That there, there is an interpretive choice there and that we have the option to decide where, where we want to be in those possibilities. Great, great. What a great yeah. way to end yeah. Yeah. yeah, and in that choosing, we, we leave the past of pointing the finger at institutions or people, and we become proactive. We, right. be, we become, you know, uh, I can't even another word, but so often we get imprisoned in bad mouthing mm -hmm. a situation as opposed to, okay, where are we and what can we do to go forward? I have a friend, female pastor, who she was first hired when they asked her if she was going to have children. Mm. And she said yes. I found this on the web. <laughs> Aside from the fact that that's an illegal interview question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. I was asked that question. Yeah, well, I was too when I first signed on as a teacher. I was asked that question. The question: Well, when you have to travel with with the men uh, on the staff, what if their wives do? 
my god wow, wow. yeah i mean i think about it now yeah, and, and, yeah. That's what but those are questions i was yeah. asked and that's just yeah. you know. thank, thank you very that's much. Super, thank you it's super interesting how um you know organizations i mean a lot of the the churches grasp onto that passage yes, versus yes, the others that yes. then split out and out. Yeah. I guess because they're more comfortable with that. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly it. It's black and white and and it doesn't challenge them. Right. Yeah. It's the path of least resistance. Right. Yeah. I think that's that's yeah. Yeah, path of least resistance. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well thank yeah. you everyone. Well this is great. You know what? I think you should come back and we got cheated on the time. Yeah. You know, we need to fix this time thing. It's off because, you know, we have the 8.30 service that ends at 9.30. And those of us that go some older jail got stuff to do. And so there's, there's not even a minute to come here. And then the same thing on the other end. Thank you, sir. So, yeah, thank you. Good to see you again. Yes, up with nice that. to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah.